So as far as how, I know this is nothing that's standard and some people could argue one way or the other, but I do like to place a wire through the Axios once I deploy the inter internal flange. To me, that way, if there is a maldeployment, which obviously we try to avoid, but if there is a case of maldeployment, I have that wire across the track where I can easily um, get something else covered metal across, either a biliary stent, esophageal stent, or another Axios, uh, just to try to salvage that track. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Indocast with your host, Leslie Bishop. This is episode 16 with our physician guest, Natalie Cosgrove from the Center for Interventional Endoscopy at Advent Health Orlando. Indocast is a GI-focused podcast for clinicians by clinicians presented to you by Boston Scientific. Together, we'll take a closer look at the data, techniques, and insights of endoscopy that matter most to listeners like you. Dr. Cosgrove, welcome to Indocast. Thank you. I'm super excited to have you here today. It's nice to be here with you at DDW. Me too. Excited and, to be here. Yeah. And I know we're going to be talking about Axios, but before we get into that, I wanted to just learn a little bit about you. So could you tell me, I don't know, I want to hear what got you into medicine, what got you into GI, what got you into therapeutic GI? Oh, gosh. Uh, I actually was interested in medicine back in high school. We had to look into each career, and I just really liked the science part and the humanistic part and obviously taking care of patients. I had a neighbor who was a female gastroenterologist, and I was actually very no inspired by her. Yeah, although initially I wanted to be a neonatologist, but uh, that didn't last very long. What was the interest in that, and why did that, why did that go away? Uh... I don't know, actually. I think seeing kids sicker is, is just, a, it's hard. It takes a special kind of person to, to do that. You weren't that special kind of person. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, so the neighbor got you interested in GI, and then what about therapeutics? Why did you decide yeah. you want to go that next level? So I went into medical school knowing I wanted to do gastroenterology, did a gastroenterology rotation, and actually saw some ERCPs, and very early on was interested in interventional endoscopy from my time at Temple University. So that was a very unique experience. And then when I went to residency, I got to see more ERCPs and participate in some research um, with some of the amazing physicians there. So it was an excellent opportunity and just kind of solidified my interest in interventional endoscopy. Okay. Well, it sounds like weaving through that, there were some mentors that were maybe really instrumental. So I would love to hear, this is something I always like learning about, what's your, how mentors have helped you in your career and maybe even your perspective as you're helping younger uh, people in their in their medical careers. Yeah, absolutely. I actually trained at different centers for each stage of my training, and part of the benefit of that was I met so many amazing mentors at each institution, and I picked up different things from each of them: career advice, uh, research advice, just general life, work-life balance advice. And what I've learned over time, and what's been reiterated in some of these uh, amazing women's groups that I'm also a part of, is you don't get everything you need from one mentor. You typically will will find a little bit of everything in different mentors. So there might be a mentor that's your research mentor, one that's more a career mentor, one that's more a lifestyle mentor, and that might change and evolve over time. So it, I've been fortunate to have a lot of people that have had input in my career and have been amazing mentors, and I'm sure I'll meet and continue to meet some in the future and hopefully become a good mentor in return. So one of the things you mentioned was work-life balance, and we talk a lot about that at Boston Scientific. I'd love to hear your best number one tip for work-life balance. You know, I went to a lecture on this as a fellow, and one of the things I picked up from the women there is you can't do it all at one, at the same time. Yeah. So you can't have balance and everything at the same time. You're going to be really good at something and give up something in return and then vice versa. So I think allowing yourself to focus on something that you need to draw your attention to at that time maybe letting other things go and then picking back up on those other things, letting that thing you were focusing on go and not feel like you need to be managing everything equally at once because you just can't. So that's been very helpful for me and I've had to continuously remind myself of that, but that was probably the best advice that I continue to forget and relearn <laughs> over time. Yeah, I would think that a lot of physicians at your level are probably pretty type A and that might actually be very yeah. hard advice to implement. Yeah. <laughs> all right. All right. Moving on to your clinical practice. Tell me about what the focus of your practice is. 
Uh, I do mainly EUS, CRCP, EMR, so complex pancreatic biliary diseases, pancreatic fluid collections and necrosis. Uh, endohepatology is an emerging interest of mine as well, and uh, quality improvement in patient safety. Okay. Awesome. So today we're going to be talking about Axios, and I'd love to hear on your experience how that technology has affected the way you drain pancreatic fluid collections. I was actually fortunate enough when I started training, they already had the cautery enhanced Axios at my institution. So I didn't actually have to see directly or or experience what it was like to have to do it the old way. Um, I did see sometimes they would do the procedures with the wire exchanges and the the traditional approach, we would say. So in patients who are sick, for example, stable enough for a procedure, but not uh, too unstable for a long procedure. It really allows us to do these procedures quickly for them, just quickly uh, decompress and get infection control. And in cases where the patient maybe can't come down for the procedure and the procedure needs to be done at bedside, these procedures can be done without fluoroscopy. So it's really changed how they treated these patients. So. Yeah. That's really good. All right. We just recently had the 70% fluid content restriction removed. And I was just curious how that has affected your practice at all. I'm glad that was removed. Am I allowed to say that? (laughs) That You're glad it was removed? Yes, you're, you're, you're allowed to say that. You know, with quantifying percent of necrosis, there really is no standard way of doing that. So I think at the forefront, it's really hard to estimate and really stick to that 30%. And often cross sectional imaging, MRI, CAT scan, really underestimates necrosis. So you might not have a true sense of the percentage until you're doing endoscopic ultrasound. And even with that, sometimes there's blood or hemorrhagic component in the collection or purulence, but arguably the patients who most likely intuitively benefit from these types of stents are the ones with more more necrosis, that higher percentage. So you really want to really have a larger bore stent to really facilitate better efflux of that necrotic debris. These are patients that, at least in retrospective studies, we know are more likely the higher percent of necrosis you have to require necrosectomy. So really having that conduit to really easily do endoscopic necrosectomy in these patients is is beneficial. So in my experience, the higher percentage necrosis collections are the ones that arguably would benefit most from, from the LAMs. With these collections with a large amount of necrotic debris, I am mindful of where I do place the lambs. I want to make sure that there's enough room for the inner flange to deploy and also to allow the fluid to efflux. So I'll look for a large anechoic pocket and target that as long as it's in an optimal location for my lambs deployment. Okay, so for debridement of walled off necrosis, tell me your, your treatment, treatment algorithm for that. You know, it's constantly evolving, to be honest. I think there's really no standard approach, and it's really going to be individualized. It really is going to depend on the individual patient and the individual necrosis collection. All these collections are very different as far as the quality or character of the necrosis, the distribution, the percent of the necrosis. So, and really a multidisciplinary approach is really important in managing these patients as well. I tend to perform drainage as the initial procedure. I don't perform necrosectomy at the same time as drainage. I know that has been shown in some studies to decrease the number of procedures for some patients, and there is benefit in that, but I do worry about lambs dislodgement. And I do believe that some patients will benefit just from drainage alone and not require necrosectomy. So I will do an endoscopic drainage, monitor the patient, see how they do clinically, and then if they're not improving or they improve and then their their symptoms worsen or they have signs of worsening infection, then I'll do a necrosectomy. Um, my frequency of necrosectomy really varies on whether they're an inpatient or an outpatient. If they're an outpatient, I'll generally do maybe one session a week of necrosectomy. If they're inpatient, I'm a little more aggressive and maybe every couple days. Um, as far as tools, there's really no standard tools, and it really depends on the character of the necrotic debris. We really need more standard tools and some studies to better qualify what works best and specifically what works best and what type of necrosis. Okay. All right. So in the interest of mitigating risk for your colleagues, I'm curious what your considerations are for when and where you place, a, place an axios. 
So as far as where, I think it's really important to be mindful. You're obviously looking for the best approach endosonographically, which is important to make sure you're picking a nice area where it's obviously close to the uh, gastric wall. There's no intervening vessels, which is really important, especially because a lot of these patients might have collateral blood flow, especially if there's a splenic vein thrombosis. They might have some gastric varices and a lot of abdominal collaterals. So making sure there's no intervening blood vessels. Endoscopically, though, you also want to be mindful of where you're placing this, especially if you think you need to go back and return and do endoscopic necrosectomy. You want to do it in a location where you're going to be able to get back in with uh -huh. that scope through the lamb. <laughs> so you don't want to be retroflexed if you can. Uh, I try to be in the more dependent portion of the, of the cavity, so a little more distal if I can. Uh, duodenum tends to be a little more difficult for drainage, so I'll try to do gastric if I can. And being mindful, especially to not end up in the esophagus, you don't want to accidentally withdraw proximally and place the lambs across the esophagus. That can create some issues with potentially metastinitis. A lot of reflux or efflux of contents into the esophagus could increase the risk of aspiration. So I'm always mindful endosonographically and endoscopically of where I'm placing these collections. Okay. As far as when to do these procedures, I think doing it earlier in the day, if you can, is important. This is not a procedure you want to necessarily be doing at 6 p.m. on a Friday <laughs> when everyone else has gone home, just in case there's an issue or a complication. You really want to have extra staff around and that multidisciplinary team that we talked about, surgical backup in case there's a complication. So if you can feasibly doing it, do it, doing these cases earlier in the day where you have that support if needed and you're also not tired or fatigued, you can really put all your energy into the procedure is probably important. Um, that seems like very good advice. <laughs> <laughs> so as far as how, I know this is nothing that's standard and some people could argue one way or the other, but I do like to place a wire through the axios once I deploy the inter internal flange. To me, that way, if there is a maldeployment, which obviously we try to avoid, but if there is a case of maldeployment, I have that wire across the track where I can easily um, get something else covered metal across, either a biliary stent, esophageal stent, or another axios, uh, just to try to salvage that track. So <laughs> I do wait until I deploy the internal flange. Sometimes if you just advance the cautery enhanced system and you put the wire through, in my experience, when that wire coils, it can push the catheter back out. So really having the inner flange deployed can kind of keep it from pushing out of that cavity once you've entered it to drain it. So I like that, and once I have a wire across and the axios has been successfully deployed, I can easily advance a pigtail catheter through over the wire. That's something I think that's still being debated in studies whether that's needed to put a plastic pigtail through the lambs. I personally like doing that. So then I have that wire that I can place the pigtail across. So I tend to be in that boat. I do put a pigtail stand across that wire. Okay. All right. So let's talk about complications. What tools do you have on hand in case there's an adverse event? I would have uh, several, at least at least several axios in case there's a maldeployment of the first one. You obviously want to have some backup ones available. I would have all the tools available for the traditional drainage too, in case you need to convert to that. Um, obviously, other covered biliary stents, esophageal stents, in case you need to kind of cross an area of maldeployment with a covered stent. And then, if you're doing necrosectomy, coag raspers really should be on hand. If there's any bleeding in the cavity, I've had to use them a couple times for some bleeding vessels. And in general, the safety can start prior to drainage. So especially if there's a hemorrhagic collection or I have suspicion for a pseudoaneurysm, I am very aggressive up front in trying to address that prior to drainage and especially prior to necrosectomy. So if there's a suggestion or concern of pseudoaneurysm, on imaging, I'll have our interventional radiology colleagues embolize that prior to doing endoscopic drainage and necrosectomy to try to decrease that bleeding risk. There's also been concerns about the metal flange of the lambs potentially causing some irritation in the back wall of the cavity, causing the development of pseudoaneurysms and risk of bleeding. I'm not sure we've definitively proven that, but I am mindful of how long I'm keeping the lambs in, and I try to remove it or exchange it out for plastic stents as soon as clinically feasible for that reason. All right, and then who are the key multidisciplinary colleagues that you have involved in case there is 
a potential risk? Like who are you making sure you have a really good relationship with? Uh, great question. And I think it's really important to be mindful of a multidisciplinary approach prior to even complications. These patients are really managed with multidisciplinary care, whether there is a complication or not. So our interventional radiology colleagues, our surgical colleagues, certainly with Deploying an axios if there is an issue that can't be rescued endoscopically, a complication, having a surgical backup with strong surgical colleagues is very important. And our interventional radiology colleagues also, oftentimes we need to do dual modality drainage and have percutaneous drains into, for example, if there's pericolic gutter extension of the collection. So we often will work kind of side by side with our interventional radiology colleagues. And if a patient is too unstable to have the procedure endoscopically, they can always have a percutaneous drain placed initially and then an endoscopic drain placed later on, which will also help decrease the risk of pancreatic cutaneous fistula. So it's really a collaboration between IR surgery and GI in successfully caring for these patients with or without complications. Okay. Dr. Cosgrove, this has been amazing. So thank you very much for coming on today. Thank you so much for having me. This has been a lot of fun. Thanks for listening to this episode of Indocast. Please subscribe to the podcast and follow Boston Scientific Endoscopy on our Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn feeds. You can also visit our virtual education platform, EduCare. That's E-D-U-C-A-R-E dot bostonscientific.com and choose gastroenterology. The site features over 180 resources, including physician-led educational videos, lectures, case studies, device training videos, procedural tips, and techniques. Thanks for listening. In the U.S., the 70% fluid content restriction was removed for the four largest hot axios sizes, 10 by 10, 15 by 10, 15 by 15, and 20 by 10. Caution. U.S. federal law restricts this device to sale by or on the order of a physician. All trademarks are the property of their respective owners. 2023 copyright Boston Scientific Corporation or its affiliates. All rights reserved. Endocast listeners, an important disclaimer. These materials are intended to describe common clinical considerations and procedural steps for the use of reference technologies but may not be appropriate for every case or patient. Decisions surrounding patient care depend on the physician's professional judgment in consideration of all available information for the individual case. Boston Scientific does not promote or encourage the use of its devices outside of their approved labeling. Case studies are not necessarily representative of clinical outcomes in all cases as individual results may vary. Thank you.